Hello everybody, so I'm back again, it's 6pm, uh, you said on Twitter that you wanted me to keep reading, so hey, that's what I'm going to do. This is a different book, um, this is The Kraken's Curse, I wrote this when I was 16 years old, so you're talking um, nearly um, 12 years ago now, uh, if not a little bit more than that. Um, but there we go, um, I make no bones about it, it could well be a 16 year old's work, in fact it is a 16 year old's work, so let's just see. The chapters in this are a lot shorter, so I'm probably going to read two or three at a time, and so tonight I'm going to read the introduction and chapters one and two of this novel, The Kraken's Curse. So, I will start with the introduction. It was the darkest of nights, no moon, no stars, just the flickering lights from a distant village. It was a night that suggested fearsome dread, and the air was filled with a strong sense of foreboding. There were several great oak trees growing from an immense crevice that engulfed the hillside, their branches reaching out into the cold air and sensing the mystery. Silently, they kept watch over the valley below. Faint sounds could be heard in the distance, the odd villager locking up for the night, or the sailors down in the bay. But there was another sound, an intimidating and mysterious sound, a sound which had not been heard before. Beyond the tallest grasses and past the gnarled bark of the oak trees, someone trudged wearily up the steep slope of a hill. He, placed to the, he paced to the side, avoiding the deep cracks in the ground, and looked towards the peak of the hill. He was dressed in flailing black trousers, ripped at the bottom, and he wore a thick hooded jumper that concealed his face. The only way to recognise him was the glow from the hideous bright green eyes. And then we have a poem, The Kraken, by Tennyson. Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep, the kraken sleepeth, faintest sunlights flee. About his shadowy sides above him swell huge sponges of millennial growth and height, and far away into the sickly light from many a wondrous grot and secret cell, unnumbered and enormous polypi. We now with giant arms the slumbering green, there hath he lain for ages and will lie, battening upon huge sea worms in his sleep, until the latter fire shall heat the deep, and then once by man and angels to be seen, in roaring he shall rise and on the surface die. Part 1 Chapter 1. The Bay The clouds cast their eyes out across the bay, keeping a close watch on all of those below. The water shone a muddy grey and looked up towards the peaceful clouds, as if to show who was the boss. Sailing boats and jet skis just managed to skim the water before being engulfed in a thick black mud, which fell just like a dark mist. This particular stretch of the Dorset coastline had been deserted for many years, and after the strange occurrence, the tourists had stopped their visits altogether. It was, in fact, this certain strange occurrence which had started the uproar that now controlled the bay. Only the very brave dared to venture this close to the shore, and almost nobody actually entered the water. There's a myth around these parts, grinned a large grey-haired man in a gruff voice. His speech was a little slurred, and every so often he bit with his teeth onto the pipe that he had in his mouth. I'm a fisherman, so I should know. He was speaking to a small young man of about twenty-two, whom had just crossed the sand dunes and was now looking out towards the horizon. I'm Captain McRae, by the way. The fisherman croaked, his grin fading as he bit into his pipe one more time. As he spoke, you could tell how he felt about the young man. His voice was low and intimidating, as if he knew that he was far superior to the gentleman standing before him. On the other hand, his grin had a warm feel, though, as if to say, Welcome to the bay. It seemed as though he was two different people trapped in one body. The young gentleman, who was sitting rather uncomfortably halfway on and halfway off a sand dune, promptly rose and addressed the captain eye to eye. My dear sir, he rasped in an uneasy tone, if there is any truth in that drivel apart from your name and occupation, then I would be wise to ignore it. He then walked across to the captain with a smirk on his face. When standing within two feet of him, he proceeded to give him a hearty pack on the pat on the back. There is no myth surrounding this bay. You just do not have the strength or the courage to accept that this area has been ruined since both I and my father left. The captain, who had been rather surprised by the young man's change of tact, suddenly turned to him with a look of shock on his face. 
And what do you mean by that remark? He stuttered. Who are you anyway? The young gentleman only laughed as he backed away. Wouldn't you like to know, my dear captain? Of course, I'm not going to tell you. You'll have to find that one out for yourself. He paused for a few seconds, perhaps contemplating whether this would be a suitable time to leave, and then he continued. Now, I must bid you farewell, and wish you good luck with solving the mystery of my person. And with that, he turned back to face the sand dunes from which he had arrived, and walked until he disappeared out of sight. Captain McRae was left in the wide expanse of the open bay, to dwell upon what had taken place. It was true, he couldn't deny it. The young gentleman who, a few minutes earlier, had stood in this very spot, definitely reminded him of someone, although he couldn't put his finger on precisely who. Chapter 2. Hopes for the Future Later that evening, the young man was sitting on the edge of the cliff looking out to sea. His legs were dangling aimlessly and his mind was deep in thought. He had certainly had an effect on the captain, and it was certainly true that this part of the coast had deteriorated greatly since he had left. But everything else he had told McRae was complete rubbish. He could not deny that he had heard many people talk about the myth before now. It was commonplace among the villagers, and although everyone else seemed to know about it, the young man himself didn't have any idea what this myth might entail. He knew that his father had always believed in mysteries and folk tale, but he didn't always carry these beliefs himself. As he looked out across the dark sea, the young man noticed a small fishing boat alive in the moonlight. He was suddenly overcome with a curiosity and could not help but wonder whether the old fisherman was aboard this boat and whether or not he had the same thoughts and feelings going through his head. It was a hard situation to come to terms with. There was a time when he felt that his return to the village would be a joyous experience and that all traces of his problematic past would be forgotten. But upon his arrival, he could tell that this was not so. The captain did not remember him, although that could be a blessing in disguise. And he didn't dare venture into the village for fear of the rumours and gossip that would surely spread like wildflower, uh, f wildfire. Just behind him, on the grassy hillside, the young man had lit a fire to keep himself warm. Periodically, he added more sticks and dried out leaves to it and made sure that its warmth was still escaping into the surrounding air. He reached backwards and warmed his hands on the flames. They swayed and darted before his eyes. Lazily, the young man pulled himself up from the position on the cliff edge and reached for his satchel. Then he proceeded to dampen down the fire so that its light could no longer be seen on the cliff top. The night was drawing in now, like a silent enemy, pulling its cloak around the folding hills and jagged cliff faces of the coast. The stars had just come out to play and were dancing around the moon like tiny fireflies. It was an awe-inspiring sight, and one that even the young man had to admit, filled him with hope and the inspiration, that in the end, everything would turn out right, and he would at last be at peace to enjoy the landscape that he loved so much. So that's chapters 1, 2, and of course the introduction um, to this book, The Kraken's Curse, which you've asked me to read, um, to continue reading. So because we're going to read two chapters an evening, um, probably... This would take about 15 days to read rather than 30, and so we might well still be in lockdown. Hopefully not, uh, but we might be by the time we finish this one. So thank you for joining me. I'm back same time tomorrow to read chapters uh, number three and four.